What kind of man chooses physical labor over a contemplative life? It's possible, though, now that he thinks about it, that Julian might have liked him better, or respected him more, as a maker of things you could touch. Say this for Julian, a career salesman. He's lived the life that he was meant to live, and followed the only trajectory that truly suits him from start to finish. He's rendered small-town America on the page and on the screen in a critically acclaimed series of novels and short stories, and he's picked up a Pulitzer Prize along the way. Richard Russo is my guest today. Hello and welcome to the show. It's great to be here. Well, you're in Paris as a special guest of the Festival America. That's an event that brings together the best of a continent's worth of literature every two years here in Paris. You have a very enthusiastic readership here in France. You received the Grand Prix de la Littérature Américaine last year. What do you think it is about your stories, which are so American, that uh, appeal to European readers? I'd love to know. I would love to write more of them, just, <laughs> just for this wonderful audience in France. Um, I, I think that, um, that it has something to do with my family, actually, more than, maybe more than it has to do with me. Um, my father... Uh, my grandfather was in two world wars. He was in the he was in the he was too young for the first and too old for the second. But he was he managed to be in both. Um, my father was um, a D-Day guy, uh, Utah Beach, uh, made it all the way to Berlin when many didn't. And I think growing up in this small town in upstate New York where I, where I grew up, I had, I had a real sense of myself as a kid long before I ever thought about being a writer um, as, as, as being an American um, and, and being part of the American story, which I think is particularly interesting because we were a family that didn't, didn't have any money. We certainly didn't have any privilege. Um, but that was what, to my parents, to my grandparents, that's what it meant to be an American, uh, was, to, uh, was to come from someplace else and to, and to make a new life, a new identity. So, I mean, I, I kind of absorbed all of that, I think, with my mother's milk. And as I, as I, as I grew up on the, in the neighborhood that I grew up in, there were, um, um, uh, there were English and Irish and Poles and Italians and... And um, everybody trying to be American. Um, and the Second World War, kind of all of that coalesced in the Second World War. And when it was over and I came along, that was, that was, that was the story. That was my story, my neighborhood, my, my town. 20th century American dream, in a way. Now, one of the events you're participating in here in Paris is a Pulitzer evening, a very exclusive club, <laughs> Colson Whitehead, Jeffrey Eugenides, Michael Chabon. Now, you've had this prefix Pulitzer Prize winning author for a few years now. What's that changed for you? Well, I think in so it's changed everything and nothing in the sense that uh, everything in the sense that um, somebody said the day I got the prize, well, they, somebody just wrote the first line of your epitaph. Uh, but it's, I mean, it's on, it's on all of my books now, not just the one that won the prize. Um, and I became known for that novel, but of course it floated all of my backlist. All of, all of, all of my earlier novels um, were republished in a new and beautiful and uniform format. And suddenly, um, I had the kind of fame that that not many not many writers have, and writers' fame is different from other people's fame. But but um, suddenly, my suddenly my name was on people's lips, and um, with with each new book, um, I felt uh, the need to be, if possible, worthy of that prize because. I'd like to think that the book was good, but there were a lot of good books that year, and you have to be you have to be lucky to win one of those. So, I mean, it changed it it changed so much. What it didn't change was the nature of the task, which is difficult and sometimes bigger um, than we are who write. And so, it didn't make writing novels any easier. Um, it just gave me probably a little bit more confidence as I approach what still seems to me an impossible task. Um, so it didn't change that. OK, well, the Pulitzer Roundtable is just one of the events at the Festival America this year. Our reporter, Kathy Clifford, has been taking a closer look at what's on offer at this year's edition. Here's more from her. 
74 authors from across the Americas are gathered here in Vincennes for this year's Festival America. Now, a key theme this year is Canada, with a record number of Canadian authors present. And the Queen herself of Canadian literature, Margaret Atwood, is appearing via video link. Now, the success of the TV adaptation of her famous novel, The Handmaid's Tale, has sparked a whole new genre of dystopian feminist literature. One of them is Red Clocks by another guest here, Lainey Zumas. And she's here with me and she's going to sign my book for me. The story is told from the perspective of four different women. Each one is profoundly affected by new US laws giving rights to the fertilized embryo. For Lainey Zumas, this is all too close to becoming a reality. Lainey, would you class this as strictly dystopian fiction? When I was writing it, um, I, I thought of it as a world somewhat separate from our own, but uh, with the political developments in America happening right now, it's getting less and less like a dystopian novel and more like reality, but I pray that it remains dystopian. The festival was created in the aftermath of 9-11 with the idea of bringing together authors to talk about the issues they've touched upon within the work. Now the guest of honor this year is John Irving as he celebrates the 40th anniversary of his cult novel, The World According to Garb. The book follows the character of a writer, T.S. Garb, from his rather unusual conception in the 1940s right up to his death, weaving between his fiction and his reality with surreal humor and a real tragic comic tone. The novel constantly plays around with gender roles, making it still a very relevant read 40 years later. Now, Kathy mentioned John Irving there, someone who's been involved with film adaptations of his work, and that's something you've done as well, written screenplays as well as books. I had a laugh at your depiction of the film industry in the short story Milton and Marcus, uh, that's in the mm -hmm. collection trajectory. Speaking about the beauty and talent that Hollywood sometimes involves, there's a quote that says, it's hard to imagine how ordinary rules of behaviour might apply to people so ridiculously blessed. Now, are movie people really that terrible, that ruthless? <laughs> Um, I had to uh, make up a lot of that uh, in the sense that um, my experience in Hollywood has been just so much better than the vast majority of writers who go there. And I've had to kind of depend on some of the war stories that I've heard from, from other writers about the way they've been treated or where the, the way their work has been treated. I've been blessed. I mean, I've worked um, my my fir the first novel of mine that was made into a movie was uh, was directed by the iconic film director Robert Benton, and, and it starred Paul Newman, who who made that character, my main character of Sully, um, uh, took that character into a different realm. And when it came time for me to write a sequel to that novel, twenty years later. Um, there were there were many, many thousands of people who had come to my work because of his portrayal um, of Sully. And he was he was later in another um, uh, movie of mine, Empire Falls, with, with just a stellar cast of wonderful people like Ed Harris and and uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. So, I mean, I have been I have I have worked with some of the most talented and um, and smart people in Hollywood. And in that sense, um, I've really had the best of that world. So, so some of so some of the snark um, in in Milton and Marcus uh, is actually more based on the experiences of some of my writer friends who were not treated nearly as as reverentially as I was treated. Okay, so that's fictional. That's good to know. Now, in the same collection of short stories trajectory, uh, there is something of your own trajectory. You came to full time writing via academia, and there is a, a story that focuses on that. Uh, university is set on a university campus and the protagonist says about one of the students here for want of a better word was a voice is having a voice an authorial voice something you can teach someone or is that innate there's certain th there's certain things that you can do as a teacher if you suspect that a writer is hasn't found his or her own voice yet you can suggest that to the, to the writer, that there's something about themselves that they haven't discovered yet and urge them to find, find that out. For me, it was the very last piece of the puzzle. I learned um, in, in a writing program, a very good program at the University of Arizona, I, I learned to use all of my tools. I learned how to write dialogue. 
Um, I learned how to develop characters. I learned what value setting can be in a story. I learned all of that stuff. But at that point, I didn't quite know who I was. And you know what we were talking about earlier, that sense of myself as an American writer and how important my town, my family, my, my, my surroundings were. Uh, when I first started writing, I was trying to run away from all of that. I wanted to write about sex, which I knew nothing about. I wanted to write, I wanted to write about crime, which I knew nothing about. I wanted to be a big city writer. So I was running away from all the things that I knew, and I was never going to find my voice until, until I was willing to own up to who I was and who I loved uh, and what I loved. And so for many people, you, you can't teach a person what her voice or his voice is, but you can sense when they haven't found it yet and ask them the questions that will, that will help them get there. Well, I think you certainly did. Um, well, we're wrapping up the show with something musical. We asked you for a cultural tip, and you, ne you named someone who needs no introduction, the boss, Bruce Springsteen, yeah. who's released a special uh, edition box set earlier this year. He's also going on tour. What's made you a fan of his music? It's funny. I came to Springsteen kind of late in the, in the, in the early albums, um, uh, Born in the USA. I was just learning to write right then, and I was devoting all of my attention to, to writing. And there was a period of a decade or maybe a decade and a half where I wasn't listening to music at all. And I came to, I came to Springsteen kind of around the, the time of the Nebraska album and, and, and became convinced that he was the preeminent storytelling songwriter of, of our time and have since gone back to the early work. And, of course, I've stuck with him. I mean, he got us, he got us through Vietnam. He got us through um, the AIDS epidemic and the attacks on the World Trade Center. He is just, I can't imagine anybody meaning more to America than Bruce Springsteen has. And he still is very much on stage. Richard Russo, that's all we've got time for. Thank you so much for joining us It's today. been a delight. Thank you. Well, here is a glimpse of a couple of legendary performances from Bruce Springsteen. Remember to check out our website and you can also keep up with Encore on social media too. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. The coca plant is illegal in Colombia, yet it remains the country's most widely grown plant. The farms in the region of Catatumbo have turned into battlegrounds. Several organizations are fighting to take over since the FARC area disarmed. They are battling each other to gain control of the area, leaving locals caught in the crossfire. In an attempt to lower tensions, the government has implemented a coca substitution plan, but this anti-drug policy isn't working out as planned. Our special correspondents are the real eyewitnesses of the news. Join me for reporters. 